So far, I've been talking mainly about the magnetic properties of iron, which is the most striking and best known of all the magnetic bodies. But there are other bodies which are not quite so magnetic, if we can put it that way, as iron, but are quite distinctly so. Uh, iron's two companions in the periodic table, nickel and cobalt, are quite strong magnetic bodies. Here is a piece of iron, and of course, my magnet sticks to it like anything and picks it up. Here's a piece of pure nickel. It, you see, it is, it, it, it is quite magnetic too. And here are some little chunks of cobalt, which are picked up by the magnet. Most metals, however, are not magnetic in this way at all. Piece of aluminium, absolutely inert. And here, and this is interesting, here's a piece of stainless steel. Although it's nearly all iron, it's an alloy of iron to make it stainless, you see it is not magnetic either. I might perhaps say that this is rather old-fashioned stainless steel, they make it more cheaply nowadays, it's got more iron in it, and if you try it on one of your stainless steel knives, you'll probably find the magnet will pick it up. Well, those are all what are called ferromagnetic bodies, iron, cobalt and nickel, strongly magnetic. Now, on the other hand, there's a whole class of bodies which are magnetic, but very, very weakly so. They only show that they want to get from a weak field into a strong field, but the force is extremely small. It's not that just some are a bit more so and some are a bit less so. There's a whole class of difference between the ferromagnetics, like iron and nickel, and the paramagnetics, as they're called, which have this feeble effect. For instance, salts of iron, the solution of iron salt, is very, very feebly magnetic, in the sense that if you have one of these solutions of iron, it tries to move from a place where the field is weak into a place where the field is strong just like a magnetic material like iron does. Here, for instance, I've got in this tube, this U-tube, a solution of ferric chloride, and one limb of the tube is between the poles of this very powerful electromagnet. And I think you'll see if I switch the magnet on by means of this switch here, the liquid will be sucked up between the poles, showing it's trying to get into this strongly magnetic field. There, you go up, down again on and off. So that is a feebly magnetic body. Oxygen shows this property rather interestingly. It's hard to see with oxygen as a gas because of course it's so tenuous. But when we have oxygen in liquid form, then you can see it is quite a magnetic body. I've got a pot of liquid oxygen here. Here we've got a very powerful permanent magnet. One of those made in the war for the magnetron, a radar device, which needed a very strong field between the poles here. If I take this pot of oxygen and pour it between the poles, I think you'll see it sticks in the strong magnetic field. Watch now. You see it boiling away between the poles? It boils away, of course, because the poles for it are very, very hot indeed. Why this difference? It's not because in these two classes of body, and by the way, we call these ferromagnetic, the ones that are like iron, nickel and cobalt, and paramagnetic, the very weak ones, is not because we haven't got little atomic magnets. In the paramagnetic ones, the atoms are little magnets, just as they are in iron. The difference in them comes about in this way. In a body like iron, these small magnets are like the magnets of our Ewing model. They influence each other so strongly that they all tend to line up in rows, in domains, pointing the same way. The north pole of one pointing to the south pole of the next. The same magnets are there in the paramagnetics, but their influence on each other is feebler. And there isn't this tendency for them all to arrange themselves in rows. Now, when we've got domains, and groups of atoms all in rows, it's much easier to magnetize that body than it is when the atoms are all higgledy-piggledy, where they don't influence each other so as to stick in rows. 
Perhaps I can explain what I mean by an analogy. You know how uh, a, a clever dog can say, drive a flock of a hundred sheep down the road. Why is it so easy for the dog? <coughs> because sheep behave in a sheepish way. All of them point the same way. If one sheep's doing something, all the rest are doing the same. So it's very easy for the dog to get the whole lot to point the way he wants them to go. Compare that with a job a dog would have if it tried to drive a flock of a hundred cats along the road. Now, cats are orientated by dogs just as much as sheep are. They turn, tend to turn away from the dog. But they're independent. They don't work in domains like sheep do. Each cat has its own idea of where it wants to point. And so, although in general the cats will run away from the dog, they won't go along as a neat little flock. In other words, sheep are ferromagnetic and cats are paramagnetic. Now, here's another point about these magnetic bodies. Iron is strongly magnetic, as we know. But if you heat a piece of iron red hot, it ceases to be magnetic. Why? Well, we can illustrate that again with this Ewing model. I've got the Ewing model here, and near it, I've got a strong magnet, and this magnet is magnetizing the model. It's making all little arrows point from here towards here. The reason why, above a certain temperature, which we call the Curie point, the iron ceases to be magnetic, is that the heat motions, which are always disturbing things, which are a force of disorder, the heat motions tend to wriggle these little atoms more and more violently until finally the domains are broken up. Now, I'm going to illustrate that. I've got a screwdriver here, which is a, just a little bit magnetic, as all the tools in the workshop always are. And I'll simulate heat motion by wriggling the screwdriver over the model, so as to stir these all up. And you will see we break up the domains. That's what heat does. Now our iron is red hot. It ceased to be magnetic. I let it cool down by taking my screwdriver away, and they'll all settle down into the domain again. That is to say, it has now become magnetic again. I could illustrate this by a piece of red hot iron. That's not so convenient to have on the lecture bench. So I've got here some metals which have a much lower Curie point. The Curie point, you remember, is the point at which the heat motion makes them into non-magnetic materials. Now, this one is called Monel metal, and it's around the rim of a wheel. The wheel is here between the poles of a very strong magnet, which is pulling the rim there and the rim there equally. If I warm up the rim on this side, raise it above its Curie point, it will cease to be magnetic. The magnet will no longer attract the rim here. It will go on attracting that side, and you will see the result. The rim, as you see, will go round and round. Simply because I'm destroying the magnetic property on this side of the rim. Finally, here's a metal with so low a Curie point that it loses its magnetic property even the temperature of boiling water. You see, this is quite a, quite a magnetic material, as you see when I swing it. I just dip it in the boiling water. Let it get really hot. And now, do you see, it's quite inert. Put it in cold water again. It's got back its magnetic property. Now I'm going to talk about a subject that's always interested me very much, I find fascinating, and that is the question of the Earth's magnetism. We've said that the Earth behaves as if it were a large magnet. That's why a compass points north. Uh, what we find, of course, is that if we plan the direction of the magnetic force over the surface of the Earth, where we can measure it, it has a, the form that we'd expect if there were a large magnet right at the middle of the Earth. Here I've got a picture of the lines of force that there would be 
around such a magnet. Here, if we suppose there's a magnet at the center, uh, these are the sort of lines of force which it would have. And I, by this red circle, I've shown the surface of the Earth. And you will see that, for instance, at this sort of latitude, the real direction of the lines of force dip rather steeply into the ground, uh, where we are here in England. At the North Pole itself, the magnet would point straight down into the ground. At the equator, on the other hand, the lines of force are horizontal. And then as we go into the southern hemisphere, here, of course, we come round again to the South Pole, and there the North Pole of our compass would point straight up in the air. Here is a mock-up. Let's see it happening, actually, with a model of the Earth. A globe here, and at the centre of this, we have got a magnet. And I've got a compass needle here, what's called a dip circle, because the angle with which it points down into the ground is called the dip. A dip circle which can move round in a vertical plane. When I place it down towards the south pole, it's dipping steeply into the ground, the south pole of the magnet. Now, as I bring it up, you see it's coming over. When I get about to the equator, it points pretty well horizontally. And as I go up into the northern part of the world, now the north pole is pointing down into the earth. And when I get right up here, of course, at the north, magnetic north pole, the compass needle points straight down into the ground. It turns over as we move it around the world. So you see, if we were in a closed room, but were allowed uh, to have a dip needle, we could tell what latitude we are in just by seeing the angle with which the dip needle pointed down into the ground. A study of this dip in past ages has told us a great deal about the history of the world, history of the Earth. About 40 years ago, there was a famous uh, German scientist, Wegener, who put forward a very novel and startling theory. He said the continents have not always been where they are now. They have drifted about all over the place on the surface of the world, rather like large ice flows floating on a sea the continents being solid and floating under kind of gooey stuff, heavier stuff, underneath, so that they could very, very slowly move. He was led to this by the queer things we find about the apparent climate in past ages. For instance, coal. It's obvious. The kind of plants that made our coal could only have grown in the tropics, in a uniformly warm climate. Yet, you find coal in England and even in Spitsbergen. Magnolias, fossil magnolias, are found in Greenland. And at the opposite end, the rocks in India show scratches, which could only have been made by great ice sheets coming over India from the south, although India is now north of the equator. So he said, it's not because the climate in Spitsbergen was once tropical, but because Spitsbergen was once in the tropics. It's moved from down there up to where it is now. There was a great deal of disbelief of such a novel theory. But now, magnetism has come to the rescue, and Wegener has been proved abundantly right. We saw it with our little Ewing model, that if the atomic magnets settle down in a magnetic field, they tend to point in the direction of that field. Now, that happens in the rocks. When lava cools, there are atomic magnets in the lava, and the lava, very feebly, takes up the magnetism of the Earth and shows the direction of the field at the time it cooled. So, by getting pieces of lava from past geological ages, one can measure the dip, if the lava hasn't shifted its position, and tell what latitude that country was in when the lava was formed. And, of course, also, you can tell which way round that country pointed, because you know where the North Pole is. So, you see, now, we can trace back the history of the continents. It's an absolutely fascinating story. It's clear that Wegener was right. They have moved a great deal. It's also clear that, in the course of the ages, at first, there was only one continent. All the land that we know now was joined together in one piece. 
and cracks have formed and it has split apart and made the separate continents as we know them now. The magnetism has shown us how that has happened. This is the world more or less as it is now. You'll recognize North America, South America, Africa, Europe. We've left out Asia and so on because the distortion would be too great. And here, of course, Greenland. Now, we've got to take as the shape of the continents, not the dry land that you see in red, but the edge of the continental shelf. You probably know that the land runs out under a very shallow sea for some way and then suddenly drops very steeply into the deep sea. And if we take the outlines of the continental shells, you will see the fit is almost fantastic. That's the way, for instance, that South America fitted onto Africa. And... North America fitted on here like this. There's a little bit lost there. That's accounted for by odd West Indies and so on. Europe fitted in here. And that left a place here into which Greenland very neatly fits. It is just like a jigsaw puzzle. So the simple explanation has now come through magnetism which explains the curious way the climate has altered in the past. A very, very fascinating and lovely theory. Well, that concludes my series on magnetism and I hope these demonstrations will show you that there's a good deal more to magnetism than just picking up pins. <laughs>